Hey guys! Very nice to finally see you again. Today we are going to be revisiting and expanding on an old topic, specifically base management and the relevant facilities required to make sure the base is sufficient. However, we'll be more focused on the various bases one can visit for each map. But come on up and we'll talk. Hey guys! Welcome back! So today's discussion will be a bit of a follow-up from our last base guide, where we discuss facilities and relevant 5th tier skills. This time, we'll be discussing what I think are the best bases in each map. Hmm, can you really say what the best bases are since each base can serve different needs dependent on playstyle? For example, some bases might be best for a traitor as a leader or perhaps a warlord leader, as the built-in facility layout will be tailored to their style. I see what you're saying, but I guess we'll discuss that first. Junior? Alright, Mascara, yes, there are bases that seem to cater to particular leadership styles. Such as the police station for sheriffs and warlords, or the brewing company in the Mayor Valley map for traders. Yes, exactly. But regardless of leadership style, in this Onion's opinion, the most beneficial goal of any community would be to create a self-sufficient base. This does not only include resources, but also morale, defensibility, and a sufficient population to create a sustainable rotation of survivors. Now yes, one has the liberty to choose whichever base they want, but I would say that the larger, or later game bases, hold the highest benefits, although they carry the heftier costs of influence, that being around 1500 or 3500 But I wouldn't say one should always be swayed by the price tag. Interesting. Why would you say that the bigger bases have the most benefits? Bigger bases require more survivors to establish, and more survivors means greater maintenance and strain on one's resources. But yet you say in your previous base guide, greater resource management comes with bigger bases and more numbers. Isn't it kind of like a double-edged sword? Yes, but one side is definitely sharper than the other. The benefits can easily outweigh the detriments, and given what I had explained in my previous base guide, I would say that I have a working formula for a self-sufficient base and the right skills slash specializations, which will ultimately require 7 to 8 survivors. Alright, fine London. Let's entertain this one. Why don't we start with the newest map, that being Providence Ridge. Alright, so with this relatively new map, I would say that there are two clear options, as the other two bases are simply inferior due to the availability of facility slots. For those that remember, my formula for creating a self-sustaining base includes two hydroponics, an infirmary or field hospital, a still, a workshop slash red talon workshop, and a solar array. I must also stress the importance of the correct mods, which were discussed in my previous base guide. There is also a good chance one will need barracks to sustain the volume of survivors. So with this in mind, the two bases we are looking at are the Prescott Fire Station and the Lumber Mill, both of which are 3,500 units of influence and require 8 people. Now, the Lumber Mill is one of a kind as it is the only base in the entire game with 5 large slots. In addition, it contains 3 indoor slots and a sawmill that allows one to craft their own materials provided there is base-wide power. The Prescott Fire Station... Ooh, I kind of like this one. The Prescott Fire Station already comes with a bunch of built-in facilities, the important ones being an upgraded workshop, a generator that provides power and water, and some beds. There are two large outdoor slots open, two small outdoor slots, and one small indoor slot. Correct. Now, out of these two powerhouses for bases, I would say that the Prescott Fire Station takes the win. Now, some of you might be wondering how the fire station beats five large outdoor slots. Simply put, the Prescott fire station leaves room to build barracks, allows for building a still outdoors for base-wide water and fuel creation, and allows two slots for food production. 
This might seem like an insignificant difference, but it has a cascade of implications. My issue with the lumber mill is that there is no way of creating one's own source of base wide water without outsourcing to a water providing outpost which comes with its own fuel cost, that being two per day. Not to mention there is no way to build a still, meaning that one's fuel production is naturally stagnated through insignificant daily gains. This will require two fuel outposts in order to break even three outposts to have an insignificant surplus, and four to gain two units a day. Now yes, to be clear, I am talking about playing in the Nightmare Zone without the use of any boons. I see where you're going with this. In your previous base guide, you stressed the importance of having a good amount of fuel, not only for transportation, but also for offensive measures. Now, one does not have to live on incendiaries, but as you spoke about in your infestation guide, incendiaries are the silent killer. And as we know, silence is a major key to survival in the Nightmare Zone. And in the Nightmare Zone, the costs of production and construction are doubled. Plus, ammunition, which is a requirement for most explosives, the counterpart to incendiaries, is not as easy to produce as fuel. So putting too much stress on those reserves will only make producing firearm ammunition and explosives more difficult than it needs to be. Gaining only two units of fuel each day while stressing ammo reserves only chokes out both resources without a sustainable means of reproduction. Now the downside of the Prescott Fire Station is the amount of facilities it comes with that cannot be eliminated. For example, it comes with a generator room that provides base-wide water and power for two units of fuel, but at least allows a still for extra fuel production and the latrine and watchtower are still useful for morale. Regardless, I was still able to create a self-sustaining base. The main difference lies with my choice of outposts. With a ninth survivor, stress on food became a bit higher, though not negative each day and it required some adjustments. But the point is, the base can sustain itself with the right facilities and population. I personally do not recommend going higher than 9 survivors though. Defensively, I would also give the fire station the advantage, mostly because of the built-in watchtower, and the adjacent bell tower meant for distracting zeds. Alright, so you would say that the Prescott Fire Station is better than the Lumber Mill because of its defensibility and the inability to create base-wide water with a facility. This in turn has a cascade of effects that simply cause undue stress on more resources. You also mentioned that the Prescott Fire Station comes with a latrine and watchtower for morale maintenance. Fine. Let's do Drucker County now. This one's a bit of a toss-up. The two contenders are Mike's Concrete and the Barricaded Strip Mall. Both can work with my desired facility layout, just somewhat differently. Mike's Concrete has a built-in generator, which does come with a fuel cost. Otherwise though, all other spaces allow for the required facilities for self-sustainability. But London, wouldn't you say there is a minor advantage given to the Strip Mall? After all, it does come with a kitchen, a gym, an infirmary, a latrine, and a rooftop. The strip mall at least provides opportunities for boosting morale. Meanwhile, Mike's Concrete can sustain all the required facilities for self-sufficiency, but leaves virtually no room for any significant morale-boosting facilities. Hmm, you make a very good point. This is true that the strip mall will have an easier time keeping survivors happy with morale boosting effects. The only downside is that the base on the ground is a bit cramped and costs 3500 units of influence. However, this onion does not consider cost to be too significant of a factor. The best base for Drucker County is the strip mall. Ooh, let's do Mayor Valley, and I bet I already know which two bases you're looking at. There is the Whitney Field base and Camp Kelly Club. Well, I'm glad you're catching on. But yes, these two are easily the biggest bases of Mayor Valley. Whitney Field, however, has a cost of 3,500 influence, while Camp Kellenclaw costs 1,000. Now, I find that this is one of those cases where spending more does not necessarily mean having greater value. 
Looking at Whitney Field first, it is revered for being the only base with three large slots. One for a solar array, one for barracks, and possibly a field hospital. And it has five small slots, two for hydroponics, one for a still, one for beds, and one for a workshop while requiring eight people. The base comes with three outdoor beds, each of which can be stripped away for other facilities. However, unless one is getting substantial bedding from other enclaves, one will likely require the use of barracks and a set of outdoor beds. Regardless though, the facility slots fit perfectly fine. Additionally, the base has its own watchtowers, or bleachers. The major downside with this base is that it seems to be under constant attack, at least in my experience anyway. There is also natural tax on morale if one has any outdoor beds. Lastly, sieges in the Whitney Field base can be particularly dangerous since Zeds can climb over most of the barriers. Not to mention, the base is a bit cramped and can lead one to becoming overwhelmed if managed incorrectly, or if a juggernaut manages to find their way in. Well, what about the campsite? From what I can remember, the base is just as effective as Whitney Field even though it only has two large slots and four small slots. The equalizing aspect is that it comes with eight beds despite only requiring five survivors to claim. The two large outdoor slots can be used for a solar array and a field hospital, while the one outdoor small slot can be used for the crucial still. The last three are for a workshop and two hydroponics. Perfect observation, and I think it is important to note that the campsite is a spacious area with a wide perimeter. Now this one is also somewhat of a double-edged sword because Zeds come in from every side of that perimeter. Plus, parts of it are damaged which leave a clear gateway for any kind of Zed to enter by surprise. The base also comes with a well, built in for base-wide water. It would seem as though Camp Kalenkwa has the same efficacy as a large base, but with the cost of a midway base. Although I'm not much of a kitchen user, the camp does come with a kitchen, which helps with maintaining morale. The only major downside is that it only has two parking spaces. Otherwise, I would say defensively, both bases are on similar levels. Whitney Field is cramped and under frequent attack, but at least has bleachers for overwatch with an ammo requirement. While the campsite is spacious, but difficult to monitor all aspects and barrier breaches. But I would still give the slight edge to Camp Kalenkwa, as it does not force any tax on ammunition reserves, and I personally would prefer a spacious base with extra amenities than a cramped one with three large facility slots. Fair point, London. Well, what about the last map, Cascade Hills? This one, I think, should be interesting, since there appears to be three candidates. There's the Container Fort for 3500 influence, the lock and key self storage base for 1500, and M&M &M distributing for 1500 influence. Each of their layouts seem to allow for your formula of a self-sufficient base. Well, let's take a closer look. Starting off with lock and key storage base, the main issue that sticks out like a sore thumb is that it comes with only one large slot and the sheltered beds that can only accommodate four survivors. With these beds in place and upgraded, it can sustain six, which is the bare minimum for a self-sustaining base of happy survivors with the right skills. Luckily, the base does come with a still, allowing one to build two hydroponics, a workshop, and an infirmary, while leaving the large slot for a solar array. Unfortunately, there are no other amenities for boosting morale, leading to random automatic taxes on one's resources, since unhappy survivors naturally mess with the flow of resources. Plus, the lock and key base comes with a watchtower. Although helpful, puts a tax on one's ammo reserve, a tangent we have already discussed. Alright, then let's look at the m, m distributor base. It's got your precious two large slots, three open small slots, two slots with shelter beds, a built-in workshop, and 100 units of fuel storage. You can have your solar array, barracks, a still, an infirmary, 
and two hydroponics if you clear out one of the shelter beds. However, this setup of facilities will only accommodate six survivors. Excellent observation and breakdown. However, don't forget that the sheltered beds when upgraded can accommodate seven. And as I said in my previous base guide, those with eight or more survivors will likely require craftsmanship to upgrade their barracks. However, it is important to consider that sheltered beds when upgraded require one unit of materials for maintenance, something that hydroponics already have, meaning that one's materials will be at a major deficit that will be difficult to replenish consistently. Alright, so what about the container fort for 3500? The container fort is easily the most interesting base of the map, and possibly even the entire game at least from what I have experienced. It has two large outdoor slots and five outdoor small slots. The greatest bonus that comes with this base is the eight already built in beds that don't even take up a slot. Ah yes, if one wishes to replace the already established workshop, the passive effect of eight beds still remains. I understand that you like to use the Red Talon workshop and is the perfect replacement without losing beds. So automatically, anybody moving in with 8 survivors will not need to build beds at all. They have a spot for a solar array, a level 3 infirmary, a still, two hydroponics, a leftover small slot for anything, whether it be more food, a kitchen for morale, and an extra large slot for something like a lounge, which will pretty much eliminate any reason your survivors may find to be in a bad mood. That is exactly right and this is not even including potential perks from other enclaves. Defensively, there are only two points of entry for ensuing sieges, making concentration very easy. Plus, Overwatch is very good, allowing good coverage of the parking lot in front of the base. Additionally, there is no extra tax on ammo for Overwatch. So overall, I would say that the container fort is the best base in Cascade Hills. So wait, London, out of all the best bases for each map, how would you rank them? There's the Container Fort, Camp Kellenclaw, the Strip Mall, and the Prescott Fire Station. Well, with all things considered, I would put the Prescott Fire Station in last from Providence Ridge, Camp Kellenclaw from Mayor Valley as a third, but following close to the Strip Mall of Drucker County for second, then the Container Fort in Cascade Hills. Assuming that your evaluation is completely impeccable, London, is there really any reason one may want to choose one of the smaller bases, or perhaps the other larger bases that weren't exactly up to your standards? Well now, don't get me wrong, the other bases are viable options, just not as sustainable as the other bases with my personal formula to sustainability. I'm pretty sure there are many creative ideas out there that our guests might prefer. This is all really chalked up to opinion anyway, but perhaps we'll talk about the other bases another time. Otherwise, that is all this onion- And this onion. Okay, that is all these onions have to say. Thank you very much for stopping by guys, and we'll see you next time. Alright guys, hope to see you guys again soon.